is our goal in these community meetings is to connect with the community. Post COVID, uh, we all know that there's been a separation. We're told to stay away from you. You're told to stay away from people, social distancing, so on and so forth. And the purpose uh, of this is to get back to some normalcy, get back to get to communicate with each other, for you to know who the police are in your neighborhood, and for us to know who are the residents in that neighborhood so that we can work out problems. True community oriented policing is problem solving that doesn't just entail the police. It requires you to do some work with it as well. It's really important for us to connect with neighborhoods in a neighborhood setting rather than having one giant meeting across the city. Um, and we're hoping that these meetings kind of generate some of that neighborhood engagement. We have four police districts. The idea is that we assign an officer, at least one officer to each district on every shift so that we are able to have an officer in that area if something were to happen. As we have more officers working on the shift, then we add additional officers into the north and west districts first because those are our busiest areas and then other officers would move into Central and East to have uh, potentially two officers in every district. So we have 55 sworn personnel. Um, we added a ninth sergeant. Um, so we have 24-7 supervisory coverage from sergeants. Um, and that brings us to a total staffing of 72 people, both professional staff and sworn. What that translates though down to the community, and this is often kind of the I think shocking part is that on any given shift, we may have as few as four officers working in the entire city with one sergeant. So if you remember going back to the fact that we have 35 square miles to cover, and on any given day, we might have a call that takes two officers, three officers, four officers, and so now that leaves the rest of the city um, unaccounted for as far as uh, proactive patrol. Uh, this is perhaps uh, a challenge that I would consider to be our biggest challenge, and I think uh, Sergeant Ridgely would agree here as it relates to staffing right now, and this is a challenge that isn't unique to um, just the Fitchburg Police Department or Dane County in general, it's law enforcement. But you can see right now that we have eight vacant positions out of our patrol staffing. Okay, so that means that on every shift, uh, we have three shifts, we work eight hour shifts, so on every shift we are down officers and we tried to spread that out as evenly as possible. Um, but we have shifts that are busy. Uh, second shift is constantly busy um, just because of the number of people that are in the city and the type of activity that's going on. The night shift tends to be a little less busy just because of the fact most people are, are hopefully sleeping um, and we don't have a, a vibrant nightlife in the city, so um, that tends to be a little less busy. But So zooming into the West District, and again, if you can remember the, the diagram there, this, the trend kind of follows. Um, there is a, a little bit higher uptick in officer-initiated activity uh, in the sense that I think we've been fairly responsive to some speeding concerns and trying to be over here on a little bit more proactive basis. So I think that accounts for some of that um, this last year. Um, we also try to get out of our car and walk around. I know the chief had spent some time uh, walking through the neighborhood um, and that's something that we really like to do. However. The caveat with doing foot patrol like that is now you're out of your car and you're walking from your car and now a call comes in and so that has to be balanced when we have uh, four to five officers on the road. That's something that we try to, to balance out. So gun violence, this is what I, I one of the things that I want to talk about just because it's fresh in my mind. Here you can see and as the chief mentioned here, um, I can just pass this around. Um, we had 31 instances of, of shots fired that were verified last year. Um, several of them which were over in the Swan Creek neighborhood, but the rest of them were spread around the city. So that bag that I'm passing around there represents 66 shell casings that we recovered in, at shooting scenes last year. So if you, if you think about that, each one of those bullets is a bullet that could have gone through somebody's house, somebody's car, or a person. We had an incident uh, last week on the east side of the city where 28 casings were recovered. Does anyone want to guess how many people called? You're guessing five? Yeah. Anyone else other guesses? Zero. Zero. Zero people called. That's the purposes of some of these meetings is to show when are we going to call? Why do we want to call? And the purpose of that, because if you keep thinking on the next person who's going to call, and you can go to studies all the way down to the 70s, 
and before that of incidents that have occurred in New York City. I'm sure some of us have heard those stories in school and colleges, some of the studies where uh, a, a person's raped in, in, in the park right in the center of, uh, center of, of New York City and nobody called because you thought the next person was going to call. Those studies continue to happen. And unless we have these meetings and have that attention brought to them, will you get that attention that we need from the community? So the question I can't have a brain answer. Are we, are we ever catching anyone? Are we, are we solving any crimes? Are there any statistics on that? Because that's the one I get, I get asked the most. Um, our, I, I will say that our clearance rate is significantly higher than a national average on, on a crime like that because what we see is a very small group of individuals that are engaging in this activity. And thanks to surveillance f cameras that are out there on your doorbell, hanging above your garage, and fortunately, thank you to distinctive clothing that people like to wear, um, we're able to put together patterns and work with other law enforcement agencies. We actually facilitate a weekly meeting with, we invite every law enforcement agency in Dane County, we invite um, the Department of Corrections, we have people that attend from Dane County, uh, human services uh, periodically that, are, that work with the youth, the social workers, and so we're able to very quickly identify a lot of these individuals. Um, but w it's really hard when people don't report it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. That staffing issue, though, isn't just confined to Dayton County. I mean, this is a nation nationwide process Absolutely. as well, yeah. for at least from my reading, right? Correct. 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 I'm, I'm not to say that that's the app, you know, I mean, we... we, we <laughs> Uh, yes, it's frankly, frankly, it's something that's happened nationwide. Some cities are recovering. The east side of the state, there's many cities uh, in the Fox Valley that are starting to fill in. Waukesha County starting to fill in with their officers, and there's some cities that are still struggling. There's areas here. Part of what's going on with uh, Fitchburg, and I will probably include Sun Prairie as part of that, is uh, they're growing cities. Yeah. So they're not only we're not only struggling with staffing, but you're also grow, uh, struggling with a growing city that has a large geographical area. So I'll speak on behalf of Fitchburg. You got 34 square miles, so you got to look at staffing that area and being prepared. And and there's no nobody to, to push blame. We're not looking at pushing blame. How do we get here? It's a growing city, but it's a growing pain that we have in the city, and we have to uh, you know we have to start looking for that. It takes more than. Um people being concerned about one particular issue to, to get, drive that continued interest. But while it starts with a public safety concern, what really we should be building is a more connected community. I bring this up in nearly every topic, or in every, nearly every meeting uh, as just a separate topic here, but we're so connected with our phones and with Nextdoor and all of these things, but we're not really connected, right? We don't, we don't know our neighbors' names. We, don't, we recognize their car and that generally they leave at a certain time in the morning, but we don't necessarily know these individuals and w how to get a hold of them if there's an emergency or if their garage door is open. And to me, living in a neighborhood where I've gone out of my way to try to, uh, we had a neighborhood block party for the first time last year, it makes the neighborhood a more enjoyable place to be, in my opinion. It's one thing that gives that false sense on uh, what law enforcement is, is we go through constant training, training, retraining on, on a number of different topics. But at the end of the day, we're not a social worker and we're not a mental health expert. Uh, so for me, I want to train our people on how to communicate, how to de-escalate. Uh, and there's simple, not, I want to say simple, but there's repetitive training that goes in, I call it crisis negotiations where you're able to negotiate under uh, stressful situations, but at the end of the day, the purpose is to escalate. Whether that person's uh, having some mental health crisis or that person is uh, simply, you know, uh, homicidal, suicidal, uh, it, it doesn't change the method and how you communicate because you're trying to de-escalate it. And you're do using more listening skills than talking skills. So again, be aware of your surroundings, be aware of your property, um, and, and engage with being an active partner in crime prevention is my, my closing message.